To enjoy this and other great episodes on Patreon, check out the link in the description and subscribe via the Black Kluge tier for full access to over 100 exclusive episodes. For those of you who would like some QF swag on TeePublic t-shirts, magnets, mugs, what have you, also click on the link in the description. Just do me a favor. If five years from now I was right, you tell me. All right? Thank you. If we're still speaking. Jeez, he's such a... See, even then, he's uh, nasty. Maybe I'll stop talking to you. Yeah, I'll stop talking. Well, I don't threaten people. And and what's so great about it is, is that if I met you in person, you wouldn't have the balls to come up and say that to me. Because I'd sock you in the fucking head. And probably deck you. When I was a little kid, yeah, he just slowed it down. When I was a little kid, my dad would take me to ball games. I would sit there with my hands over my head. I was so scared to get hit by a ball. I was going to look for a Nikki Hilton. Wait, you, but you see, those good-looking rich kid, rich uh, girls, they don't go for a guy like me because they don't need my money. But how, it's my mind, not my penis. You know, I have to train. Yeah, you know? I'm, I'm working on training my penis. That's where I've been going wrong. That's why I lost half my money. <laughs> I can't believe my penis. Uh, train the mind. You do is mooch over people. You do nothing. That's, You're a big homo. That's not entirely true. What do you do? Really? <laughs> not I'm bisexual and I don't mooch off everybody. The single best thing about going out with Howard is that we get courtside seats to the Knicks game. Yeah, we loved it. Damn! <laughs> When did you have your interviews during how, the day? How, how am I supposed to find a new job? You know, like send out smoke signals? See, you know, anybody would leave that job that you left with us. And uh, the one thing I don't respond well to is humiliation. I don't respond well to it at all. You know, I don't want to be told what a shithead I am. I don't, you know, I, this is, those days are over. I've, I've suffered enough in this business. I don't need to, to find out what a shithead I am. But look at your hair. I mean, every curl was manufactured. It's terrific. And you're a radio guy. You're not even on TV. Yes, I am on TV. I'm on, on demand. And I was on E for 11 years. Yeah. That's the number one show on E for 11 years. I mean, Gary's got a wife and kids. And if I leave, who the fuck is going to hire him? Just help me out. Turn out the lights so I don't have to pay the electric bill every minute. Ah, uh, oh, makes me sick. The hair is real, and I, and I, don't, and I, don't, col- and I don't color. Don't get too frisky. I mean, if I'm thinking of a good yank. You know, no, just... no, no, it wouldn't all fall out. No, I have my own hair. And you dye it, obviously. I do not color it. As you can see, what? I have some gray in it, but no, I'm very blessed. My, my oh, grandfather... Look me in the eye, I repeat that. I swear on a stack of Bibles that I don't color my hair. It's that three months into this relationship that you told him, Howard, this relationship is all about you. Oh, I think I knew that from day one, <laughs> but I'm okay with it. It's all about him, Ed. We watch TV, what he wants to watch. We eat. We wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning. We go to bed at 8. We... I love it, though. It's yeah. my life. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to QF, a podcast about Howard Stern. I'm your host, Fillmore, a.k.a. Jim Fix, and with me is Sam. How are you tonight, my dear? I'm a big, fat whore. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's an inside joke, guys. Um, the uh, we're, we're, I'm actually doing okay. We guys decided finally to do the impetus behind, basically, QF, uh, the show that, that really would have started the show if we hadn't done the Ablo clip uh, first. Because we thought both thought that basically the, the thing was to show, to peel back the onion and show exactly how fucked up Howard and Beth's relationship is. And she didn't come off nearly as poorly in the Abla one as she did in this video. So both, go, ahead. Yeah, both, go ahead. Both both have very unique qualities about them, though, where we're seeing something that, one, we never really saw again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Everything was very... Uh, It was very propagandized after that and Mm -hmm. cookie cutter. And, you know, he really made sure besides the King of All Black clip, the Sal interview, the or the Benji interview, this and the Ablo thing, there were very rare occurrences in far and few between where you could catch really her personality. Yep. And in, in actual fact, uh, this one, again, we the reason why this one was only one and done, we're going to get into a little further in the episode. Um, but uh, this is going to be a multi-part. We've got the wrap-up show segments. We've got the video. So we're just going to go right into it, guys, and hope you enjoy this. And um, if those, incidentally, those of you on Patreon who feel you want to give more, by all means, please do. We have a couple people that, uh, more than a couple people actually, that up their uh, sub from whatever it was from the uh, 
from the, uh, I can't remember all the tiers. Black Kluge is the $5 tier. Some of people have upped them just because they want to give more money, and God bless you, because uh, we don't, you know, we... Was this one going to be under the Arabian horse tier? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not quite yet. So this is the better half. It was a one-and-done show from 228 2006 and it involved all the spouses or would-be spouses and slash girlfriends or Mr. and Mr. X, uh, who was with Robin, I believe, at the time, or wasn't, and did they never told anybody, but they were not far from breaking up. I think it was within a year they were they were done. Well, Robin was always very sus with her relationships when they start, when they end. You know, yep. she doesn't really give many. The news department really has to work overtime to figure out what the fuck's going on with Robin's life. Yeah. So they had John Hine host this. And um, that's probably a good reason why it it ended. And now, with just to set it up, guys, we believe it's in the evening. There's all kinds of drinks. It's Beth's three sheets to the wind. And um, she came off so poorly in this. And uh, we thought you guys would definitely get something out of this. We also have to give context that this was when Sirius was just starting. Mm -hmm. So they were trying all these new avenues now that they have this new medium and mm -hmm. one of them was going to be this side project with John Hine hosting and they thought it would be a great idea to have the wives of you Mary so Gary's wife Beth Dana Artie's girlfriend and Fred Norris's wife and was there anybody oh, else and Mr. X and Mr. X and get them all drunk and get them in a room together and ask questions but mm -hmm. since Beth's relationship was not new, but fairly more public. It wasn't so new, but it was more and more public. So people were very curious about Beth, too. She shut I that think. down right away. And he got so nervous. You'll see. Yeah, you'll see. And the other thing is, guys, we're not going to get too hung up on what they look like and what they're dressed like in this. Yeah. Like it is, it is visual. We have to mention a little of that, but we're not going to do what what the other, like I said, the aforementioned Malikis Manny did, and go get hung up on it because honestly, most right. of you are going to be listening to this, not watching it. So here we go. <laughs> This is John Hine. I'm going to be hosting The Better Half. It's where I'm going to talk to the better halves of uh, Howard, Artie, Fred, Robin, and Gary. Specifically, uh, Beth O, Mary Delabate, Allison Norris, uh, Dana, and uh, Mr. X. And uh, we're going to be talking about what goes on in the show, but hear about it from their perspective. So uh, getting ready, and it's uh, going to be a lot of fun. And we know, incidentally, that there is a huge hate on for John Hine. Kayla definitely wants to do some more John Hine material. And I'm like, people hate him. Like, he's so, they hate him the way they hate, you know, plain burgers, the way he likes plain burgers. He's not that interesting. He's not compelling. Do you think that he did this just as, not even his job, this was an add-on? I think he would do anything that was asked of him. Mm -hmm. But I also think that he was really gunning for an interview angle that he wanted to be known as that type of host that he mm -hmm. is a great interviewer mm -hmm. and do you think that the okay the, we'll go through the whole thing but before we start what do you believe was the reason why this never happened again do you think it was more of a coordination problem like they couldn't get all the people together again or do you think they really just didn't want to do it again like I, think, I mean, the, meaning the participants, not the not the uh, staff. No, I think this made Howard more uncomfortable than anything that's ever been on. Uh -huh. There's been instances by happenstance that make Howard uncomfortable, mm -hmm. which you know he'll never bring up again. But to put this type of segment together on purpose, that will never happen again because it made him way too uncomfortable. There's way too many balls in the air that can come crashing down on whatever narrative him and beef have cooked up. That is mm -hmm. total bullshit. So do you, and do you think he was the one that, um, that brought this idea to the table or do you think someone else did? He said he didn't have any clue as to how it would go. Well, in the beginning, there was a lot of spitballing of ideas around. So I'm sure that in some sort of creative meeting, this came up. They're probably, 
I probably think in his head he thought this would be a good idea because initially his vanity would make him think, oh, great, this will give Beth a chance to show off. I'm going to start pushing Beth and my relationship more and my hot model girlfriend, not realizing how poorly she comes off when she's not. I mean, she comes off poorly when she's in studio and he's next to her, but Uh she comes off even worse when she's given segments by herself or with other people and he's not around. Mm -hmm. And I think when he hears that, he realizes it and it was total panic. Alarm bells went off. Totally. Yeah. Gary, and this is my wife, Mary. Uh, she's about to go on the show, My Better Half. Which Mary looks good there. Spill all the secrets mm-hmm. about me and tell all the things you know about me. Howdy, my name is Dana. I'm Artie Lang's girlfriend. Um, hopefully, I'll have a chance to get Artie back for all the vicious things that he said to me. And no, I'm only kidding. Uh, she was so cute. She is just a doll. I yeah, love it. I, I no, think he... she's so um, joyful looking and sweet. I really... I re- charismatic. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to tell you how great he is. Um, and I look forward to the sitting with Allison and Mr. X and Beth and Mary. Hello, I'm Mr. X. I'm Robin's boyfriend. I'm going to do the Better Halves show. I have no idea what's going to occur with the questions are. So uh, we'll be figuring it out together. Now, I liked Mr. X a lot, actually, when he was actually, well, they did the newly weird game, which was one we're going to definitely do oil and vinaigrette and the aftermath, because that mm-hmm. was such a funny, you know, train wreck. I, as some of you, some of you are going to ask why he, they went so long disguising him and then decided to out him like this. I believe he wasn't working for the government anymore, so he could allow his face to be seen at this I, point. I believe it was some sort of privacy clearance that was fine now. Yeah. And um, I believe Robin probably, too, seems always a little bit apprehensive about her personal life coming to light unless it's she's in control of the narrative. So once she decided she was ready for that as well, mm-hmm. you know, because they're brutal <laughs> and she's brutal. So, yeah. you know, it's never really you're not sure if you're going to win in any situation when you start to bring these things to public. I will also say that Howard... I think if he could do something like, you know, how the questions are submitted to the White House now and they get pre-clearance and then if you are allowed to ask that question, then you get called on type thing. If Howard could do that for this, then maybe he would have done more of those segments where he could go over the questions with Beth and pre-script the answers and have it can ready to go that make it seem organic. Right. Maybe, but it's, it's not it's, it's, in this. Not in this. It's impossible to make him sound unrehearsed, though. Yeah, it is. He, the Beth and Howard can't do it. They can't. No, no. And then, but but the, the the conundrum is they kind of require it. They require pre, you know, practicing. They need the pre. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, like you know, it's just practicing things, making sure they have all their eyes and dotted and their T's slashed whatever um it's it's just um crossed whatever i'm sorry guys i'm a bit of a 79 it's the morning for me and uh it's comes off jarring when they do practice and when they don't practice it's awkward it's awkward yes and if they do practice you get something like the ed bradley segment in 60 minutes Oh, brutal. And the, and so there's a bit of this that's also been prepped in the same way the newly weird game was prepped and they had done all kinds of like, this is how you answer this question. Uh, and you'll hear some of that pretty soon, guys. Now, is there anything you want to answer? I'll answer anything as long as I like it. Hi, I'm Allison Norris. I'm Fred's wife. I'm here to do better half. Um, I don't know what to expect. Ask me some good questions and I'll give you some good information on what Fred's like. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe you'll be satisfied. Hi, I'm Betho. I'm here for the better half. I'm really. <laughs> oh. <You're fit. laughs> oh, my okay. God. Could it, uh, Beth, if you don't put her in the most perfect TV photography lighting, mm-hmm. she is a monster. <laughs> I'm sorry. So this is this is partially what I wanted you and some of the other broads on the show to get together and do a show like not uh, just 
like, sort of uh, pointing out how something could be improved, I guess, if that's the way to, like, you know, if you're talking about Beth and doing an interview or on the red carpet, one of those things, especially a Beth episode, because she is so, everything about her is so clearly problematic. But why? Like, explain why. In this case, it's hall lighting, first of all. The cameras are not geared for this. It's it's older cameras, too. We're keeping in mind this 2006, guys. Here's also some tells and mannerisms when you know somebody's comfortable, like Mm -hmm. Mr. X or Mary. How they come across seems natural and comfortable. Mm -hmm. Whereas Allison, her waving hand gestures, like she's waving you away. She's she's waving you away. I will answer, but she's pushing her hand away. The she's focus not, is meant. To, she she wants the focus to be elsewhere by using her hands. She's doing that. That's a that's like a move, right? It, so there clearly must be some sort of weirdness in their marriage that she's worried about coming up because she didn't come off that natural and, I guess, comfortable. But Beth even less. So Beth is less comfortable, even though she's trying to seem more comfortable you because she's like hi i'm beth oh i and then her hands and it's like the big smile of like you know the, how but, Meghan markle does it's like very l- listen you remember with the, the episode i cut with um bob it was it was meant to be because it was sketch on's job and sal was doing his week and then he interviewed beth as his celebrity interview and you but you remember the howard tv video yeah. of it yeah. and how uncomfortable she looked throughout the whole thing of course. That was only two years prior. She's still not much more comfortable. No, she's not. And again, take this and put it against Dana's interaction just for that little, you know, foray into this whole segment. It's mm-hmm. completely different. You can tell that Dana's just comfortable. Like, I got nothing to hide. I don't care. I'm comfortable with myself. This beard. <laughs> is a wackadoodle. <laughs> and yeah, the hallway lighting is not helping and the makeup and the bleach piss blonde hair and the Abercrombie yeah. shirt thing. Uh, you, you, you but she's dressed like a shirt. 15 year old fucking teenager. You know, I'm going to yeah. miss class. <laughs> Excited. All the girls have been drinking a lot of alcohol and I'm ready for the questions. I'm ready to ask. I'm ready to get the questions answered from those women in there because we've never heard their side. Wait. So this is. This is another weird thing. So she already in her head had something she wanted to say Mm pre-planned. She must have went over it in the bathroom, in the mirror, 10 to 20 to 30 times. Okay. Clearly. With Howard, though. Like this was prepped by both of them. She's probably before stuff. Okay. I'm going to say, hi, I'm Beth. Oh, I'm Howard Stern. It's girlfriend. I, I can't wait to get ready. We've been drinking. I can't wait to ask questions and get some answers. But it came out because she has been drinking and she's nervous about this whole thing like that. And she's doing the hand motions as if she said this correctly. She's continuing Mm -hmm. the hand gestures as if she didn't just massively fuck up her pre prescribed line. Go online, guys, and look at pictures of her, and just you'll see just random Beth Beth Stern, Beth Ostrowski photos. You'll see her pointing her finger at things, using these hand gesticulations, like on the Ellen Show. Any episode with her on TV, she's her hands are going all over the place. It's some. You know it's, who else does that? Go ahead. Hilaria Baldwin. Same. Re- really? Same. I don't watch enough. I don't watch enough. I've seen her with the red carpet. Her hands are down by her sides most of the time. If you see her on a TV show or when she does her Instagram videos of herself where she decides Mm -hmm. the world needs to hear what she has to say, (laughs) even after Griffmas, (laughs) where she was out as a fake Spaniard for a fucking decade, she does the same thing where it's pointing at the camera, waving her hands around, hands and fingers everywhere. It's so uncomfortable to watch. Yeah. Good evening and welcome to The Better Half. I'm John <laughs> Hine and with me tonight, we've got Mr. X, Mary Delabate, Beth O, <laughs> Dana, and Alice. I love this soft jazz. Go ahead. I feel, like, I feel like they're at a black communist meeting. Like, what are you doing? Like a, like a black socialist meeting. And they're all like, wait, am I in the wrong place? 
<laughs> right, guys. This isn't the green room, even though you'd you'd be forgiven for thinking so. It's a lot, and it's a room that never been seen before on the the Howard TV episode arc in the archives at all. It's something that when the you know the big promotion to get there happened, they probably had as like shitloads more space for Howard to use for his own his his studios. But the the idea that you never saw this space ever again leads me to believe that Sirius said. They used this one time. They never used it again. We're taking it back. Uh, you think? Or it just yeah, well, became no. Robin's closet for all closet. the crap she left. <laughs> <laughs> Blenders and stuff. So, and, and as I said, guys, it's probably at night. Uh, it certainly appears that way. And if they've been drinking it, they're not day drinking. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if Beth was. But... Um, uh, and John Hine eventually gets interrupted by Howard. You'll, you'll hear it eventually. But... Uh, Don't you think... If they had a room like this and they did this better half and then they never really used it again, why not instead of being in studio behind your computer, behind your glass, behind the monitors, whatever the fuck, once in a while switching it up on the show and getting a headset and a mic and just going into a room and having a conversation with a celebrity in this sort of setting, wouldn't that be more interesting instead of just not utilizing it? Well, he's he that that you can't he can't do that. Like he tried that in the ninety the ninety two interview show with you know Richard Lewis, and it came off so poorly because he was so clearly uncomfortable on camera with the guest there. Um, he was probably like that. That's never gone away. You see him on talk shows even to this day. He's uh. he's boring and he's stultifyingly like uh, and like if. I, I kind of wonder sometimes when he went on the Letterman show if he took some meds before he went on to kind of calm him down. Who knows? I mean, this could have been the nice breakfast room with all the ba- breakfast awaits you <laughs> and the bagels. bagels but yeah. Eh. Yeah. <laughs> the Norris. Now, the number to call is 888-STERN-100. And we're going to let all of the better halves have the mic tonight. And we're going to hear the stories that you always hear on the show from their perspective instead of Howard's or Artie's or Robin's or Gary's or Fred's. I'd like to start just by going around the room really quickly. And if you can say who you are and tell the story of how you met your better half. And actually, we're going to start with Beth. Beth, we've heard it from Howard a hundred times. How did you guys meet? John, I have to say, this is wasting up time because everybody knows how we met. That dinner party, the way Howard says the story is the same exact way that I, I will tell the story. We've said it in front of each other a million times. So waste of time on me. Let's move on to the to the gold. So there's no difference. Nothing. No, I've heard him tell it and I've said it. It's all the same. Okay. That for certain was rehearsed. That was something she t- was told by Howard to say so that A... That the, she wouldn't, she wouldn't divulge anything by accident of them. She wouldn't change something that was different from the story they've been fucking foisting on the public for at this point, five years, and so that he could get more from other people. So the segment wouldn't be wasted on stuff, you know, that they're that's their own bullshit. This reminds me of when politicians are in some sort of scandal that's going on and it's an ongoing investigation. And so all of a sudden they decide to shut up and their spokesperson said, we can't talk about this. This is an ongoing investigation. <laughs> it's just like, that's it. It's, talk to the hand. Yeah. Like you're going to have, um, you're going to have to, uh, refer to legal. You're going to have to talk to the, uh, you know, they're, they they pass the buck. They don't. You're well, yeah. you're just going to have to. I'm sorry. I can't speak on this. You can fucking speak on this. She is so she was so ready to just mm-hmm. blow this off. But it makes it like the dolt that she is doesn't realize that this sort of response, cadence, forcefulness and obviously prescribed tone, tenor, delivery it makes it so much weirder and more people are it's it's the Streisand effect where you're saying it like this makes everybody else think what is the deal well the the thing is of course she's uh, ho- like horribly her lack of genuineness is is stark i mean when you look at dana dana went on with zero affectation and when you hear her she's going to be completely charming well disarming. done <laughs> right you should be disarming beth comes off like first of all her her nature her attitude is, has always been horrific and i wonder how much of that is kind of 
fed into, like has created or made worse by being with Howard. Like not just her being prepared by him, but also just in general picking up shitty habits from him. I don't know, but I do. I equate it to remember that in Mean Girls, Karen, she's like, hi, this is Karen. And and she touches her boobs. She's like, the weather is it's raining. <laughs> she's like standing <laughs> in rain. She has well, that bimbo just affect all around her and the way she speaks. And by the way, Mary is totally side eyeing her during this. Yes. You saw it. I she saw side eyed her. And she kind of she adjusted herself a little a little away from her and looked over side eyed. Her expression changed just ever so slightly and knowingly that what That's a right. bullshit artist. She you, looked down woman to woman. I know that look. Well, yeah. And also because if you think that Yenta Gary didn't tell Mary everything about Beth and Howard. You think Gary doesn't know about Howard's mad tear and all that shit? He knows. Listen, if that episode we did on Patreon where we covered Gary in the spa with Mary and those girls gossiping and the way Gary told that story, if you think that yapper is silenced when it comes to this situation, you're dead wrong. Yeah. Dinner party that night. We haven't been apart since. Okay. Leaves more time for the others to tell their story. Mel- oh, Mary stop, Delabate, stop. how did you meet Gary? Wait, well, my story is pretty boring. <laughs> um, Jan Hine, you just lost your job as a journalist or any sort of any sort of backbone or spine. You, if you were any sort of real curious kind of wanting to be a journalistic person or interviewer, you would have well, you would have pushed back on that. Well, he's he, he, first of all, he's not trying to be a journalist and he won't ever try to be a journalist. He's his company man as far as the, the eye can see. But in, I agree with you in the fact that he could say, could you explain a little more about this, that and the other thing? I think beyond, OK, beyond her being schooled or being uh, sorry, preparing and rehearsing for this question, he was told don't push. I believe it was oh. pre-planned that he was told, oh, OK, great. Well, we can talk about everybody else then. But yeah, but the way he said it so effortlessly in that transition, like, oh, great, we can go yep. to everybody else. You're exactly right. He was probably given, read the rule book. You're not saying anything more about this than what's already being said. But if he had any integrity or cared about what the fans wanted to know, he would have said, he pushed. well, I'm not going to, I just want to know who was at that dinner party. Yes. How long were you there? Right. And eventually the eat? story about the story about Cabby being there gets kind of lost to history. But, you know, for the longest time, he's part of it. What time did he call you the next day? Yeah. <laughs> what, what was happening with your where did you live? What was that? The black dildo story? What? Your <laughs> your flute in five languages? What? Could you speak some of those languages now, according to him? I mean, come on. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Gary was at a party that a publicist was throwing, and a friend of mine invited me there. It was after work, so um, we bumped into each other, stayed for a short while, and he asked if we wanted to go someplace else to have a drink, my girlfriend and I. And we did, and I was impressed because the next morning he called me at like 9 a.m., and uh, I thought that was really early and on the ball, but I didn't know we got up and started work at 5. So, <laughs> um, you know, and then we saw each other every weekend since. That's but- I would have never talked to somebody if I went out with them, drank, and they called me at 9 a.m. <laughs> I would have never called them back. What kind of fucking maniac are you? I'm hungover. Let me sleep. I, think, I haven't even had my jack in the box. <laughs> I think a desperate Mets fan who looks like uh, he's got, he doesn't have, he, <laughs> he looks like he's from the uh, background of, let's say, Simeon characters. And pro- probably back then, too, you know, Gary had that. Cool job, considering, you know, mm-hmm. all all things considered, it was cool at the time. Well, the, the thing is, Gary, probably also faster talker, younger, partier. She probably did a little bit of coke with him as well, let's be honest. Um, he would have been that kind of, because he, he admitted on the air several times that he did. He wasn't a stranger to doing, you know, blow in the 80s the same way. And in the, and in the 90s, I'm sure, until he got married, I'm sure he partied pretty fucking hard. In fact, they've talked about it uh, multiple times about how his single life was something to behold. I think the radio industry in general back then was just laced with cocaine everywhere. So. Sure. 
Absolutely. And that was 15 years ago. Wow. That's very sweet. Very sweet. Mr. X, how did you meet Robin? I met Robin in a circular bar. We were sitting across from each other. The place was primarily empty. I was waiting for more action to come in. None came. So after two hours of staring at each other, I sent her a drink. I was prepared to leave. And as I left at this time, this was before Robin had a breast reduction. She started beating her breast on the bar to summon me back. So I came back in and I haven't been able to get away from it since, 20 years later. I, 20 years. This is such a interesting, long relationship. And this whole mating dance of, so Robin was alone at a bar. He was alone at a bar. Okay, now I didn't realize because we'd heard this before, and I've heard it, but I don't remember him saying that that the twenty year thing. Now that means he goes back to her in the eighties, like literally. That's eighty six, eighty seven, maybe eighty eight, even. Which her breasts were huge back then. They oh certainly, no, there's no question. But uh, the way it was explained to me, I think by Robin, explain. Um, I make it sound like she she called me personally. Sorry, I didn't. No, when <laughs> the way was I, that? When was yeah, that gap fast? <laughs> <laughs> when did I get a chance to speak? Um, in the uh, the way she explained it, I think it maybe she was referring to someone else, but I think she was talking about Mr. X, and that was um, he. They were friends first. And then started dating. It was one of those things where he made a move and she said, well, you know, if you're going to make a move, make it a good one, you know, that kind of thing. And then that's how it happened. And that, that, that does make sense. Robin in her book makes it sound like she was this fucking Venus flytrap of, of, you know, man catching. But uh, it doesn't sound it doesn't sound to me like she'd be the aggressor in any situation. I will say from talking to Jim Florentine, you know, over the years, and we've been friends for a long time, he made it seem like she's a lot of fun. Like, she's a good time. She goes along to get along. She can be put in any sort of environment, and whether it be she's family not, or She's not cheap. A concert, she's, not gonna fr- she's not gonna let money get in the way of a good time. She also isn't really hoity-toity when it comes to dating and going places. She just kind of goes along and is happy and fine with it and has a good time. So I think that, you know, Robin, I give her some props here. Like she is comfortable with herself enough in certain situations that she's not like Howard where he's freaking out about every little thing before he leaves the house. She just likes to have, she just likes to have a good time. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I don't think that was quite as romantic as Mary's, but still a sweet story. To oh, say okay. <laughs> Allison, how about you? Oh, um, I dread this one. Um, uh, we're like the first reality couple. <laughs> That's right. I remember really this story. Are. Now, there may be some people new to Sirius who may not be familiar with how Allison actually met Fred. So Allison, I don't. We met on uh, dial a date. I really don't understand why she's uncomfortable with this when this was all stern lore and history. I mean, everybody because it's knows. embarrassing. She was a dial a date. He fucked her the, the same night. That's why she's embarrassed. I know, but it's it's been so long and you've been married for so long. I wouldn't act like this whatsoever. Well, I think also and other you guys, you guys can beg to differ. I think at this point and for like past a certain point, she and Fred are just partners. They're not yeah. a married couple. I think they're together just for the kid. Cheaper to keep her. We got a kid now, you know, that whole thing. And you go play in King Norris and I'll go get massages and sell flip houses and I'll have a fucking cause she had a, a clothing store at one point, I seem to recall. And um and what like was it, used, real estate? Used, and real estate, yeah. And, and and they've been and they moved a bunch of times. So yeah. she was flipping houses until it was not sustainable, I'm certain. And um like the, I don't detect any great love when they're talking about each other. No, neither do I. I think that a lot of times I mean it's sad, but a lot of couples I know people who are like this. I have a friend, actually it's my sister's best friend. Her parents were like this where they were just living together, married yeah. forever, no love, lived completely separate lives but lived in the sure. same house forever. Like yeah. And then when they went off and to college, that's when they separated. Well, either way, um, what happens? So, so what you're going to hear from her, it's very, she's very, also she's uncomfortable. And this is, I, I believe guys, the last time she was ever in studio or on the air. She also, I don't know how much she had to drink, but to me from the get go seems real spacey. 
she probably she probably needed a bit more than the average person to just get herself talking. And you're right. She does seem like she's lubed up, especially later on when she gets into it a little bit more. I know we said we wouldn't talk about outfits, but I fucking hate those pants shoved into the boots like that. They look horrible. You know, the last time, you know, when I did that was when we had snow boots and snow pants back oh, in the day. Yes. Yes, it really does. <laughs> yes, that is so true. When you do, when you're little and you have your, you're like, oh man. <laughs> I mean, I mean, unless you're crossing a pond and you got the big duck boots on and you're going, I don't know, I don't know, maybe just, you know, I'm being petty. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Um, really? We no. did. We met, <laughs> we did. We met 18 years ago. And uh, I I don't know. I called in to um, the Stern Show. It was on in the morning. And, um, you know, I'm one of these people that just kind of like dares, you know, somebody dared me to do it. And I was like, okay, I'll do it. Why not? And I called and I actually got through on the phone, which is so unusual to get through on the phone. And, um, I was bachelorette number three, and to make a long story very, very short, um, my father was on the other line, so I really was very restrained about what I could say, and Howard's like, okay, so what are you going to do to Fred to, you know, win this date? And I'm like, uh, I don't know. I'm going to do nothing. <laughs> I'm going to do absolutely nothing. And they're like, oh, don't pick her. She's the worst. And, of course, Fred being as contrary as he is, he, he uh, picked me, and I went, and went to this round table of freaks because there were all these dial a dates at this table there was like person with like one leg and one okay now okay this is why it's embarrassing so she was competing <laughs> with a bunch of fucking jerry's kids for to get <laughs> to get dating this guy that everybody like they knew him as the martian and by the way guys any breathing you hear any like uh like extra little bassy things are from probably mr x or whoever it is maybe even john hine with that fucking diabetes di type 2 diabetes you know uh, microphone on him i'm surprised they didn't have the mute button option for when they're not mm -hmm. answering questions well, look at the setup next to John. It looks like it I looks know. like <laughs> the, that, the, the mechanism <laughs> <laughs> Looks like happening? it's straight off. It looks like it's straight off the original Battlestar Galactica. Anyway, I think that um, it, the other thing, like I said, she nailed him. Fred outed her later on there. I think maybe it wasn't originally stated, but uh, for the longest time, I didn't know this, but she nailed him. That he nailed her that night. Right. He, she did. I think it's great, though, that Fred being contrarian picked the girl that he thought was the nice, sweet, prudish person. And she ended up fucking him. Now, do you, you saw the episode I cut with James about the uh, the uh, Tony and Tina's wedding. Like yes. her jumping all over that. And I'd never seen that before. I found that video and I was like, holy fuck. Do you know I would do you know what Rick would do if that that guy would have no legs. Well, what, 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 what about Fred being there and That's seeing it? Saying that and not he... and then he decided like I'm going to walk out and then not also fucking throttling Howard for making an issue of it on the air and not saying you don't fucking bring this up. It but he is... allowed it to happen, and he was like, I, I couldn't live with myself. I I couldn't. There is no scenario in my head where that would ever play out. Without him bum rushing that kid the second he walked in studio, <laughs> there's none, none. No, well, in that, my that was the that was the second part. That was the one with the guy coming in and he had John try to make out with uh, Allison as if she's doing the part. I'm talking about the one where no, she's, I know they're, they're they're filming it right. They're filming it. They they got footage of the um the actual production. But I'm acting. <laughs> yeah, like she was. It, it, she she came across to me. And the way she was really unlikable in that whole, uh, not that Howard was, but she definitely sounded like, yeah, I don't really give a fuck what Fred wants. This is my life and I'm doing it. It was like a Nancy Sirianni type thing. But Nancy Sirianni, even though, you know, we can think of her as laughably a joke in the music business or whatever, at least Everything. she had some sort of talent-ish, you know, she did have some musicality, right? And she was doing this before <laughs> she was doing this before Jackie. Uh, yeah, but it doesn't make it her any less of a social climber than Allison. I uh, I think Allison is more. There was no way that Allison was thinking about acting until she Oh yeah. 
oh yeah, it was definitely one of those things that now I've you know it's manifest destiny. I've now I've I found the golden. I found my Wonka's golden ticket. <laughs> I know. I knew what I was supposed to do with my life: be in Tony and Tina's wedding. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're going to continue, guys. I and mother daughter dial a date, and I was completely bombed. I was so drunk and nervous. And I remember <laughs> saying to my girlfriend before I went, uh, I just have to get through this evening and I'm done. I don't know what I got myself into. And how was, many years later are 18, you? 18. Wow. Eight. And we actually talked all night long. And before we looked around, this is the honest truth there was nobody there. We were like, oh. I believe that. I do think, though, it's really weird that your first acting job you take when you're newlyweds is that role. Why wouldn't you be more considerate in taking something else? I'm sure opportunities would have been offered to you down the line. You don't have to jump at the first one where you're fucking basically, you know, getting felt up. Well, if you'll if you'll fuck on a first date for a dial a date just to get on the show and to meet Fred and whatever. I think you'd do just about anything. And that's why I have less respect for Allison than I do about Nancy. Nancy, at least, yeah, she was putting herself out there. She was performing and stuff. Okay. But this was, it seemed like last chance saloon. Like this is my, I'll take the back door into Hollywood if I have to. Well, what, what a short sighted dunce. I mean, why would you jump? If Fred is your bag and your entryway into this industry, you're going to jeopardize your marriage and maybe end it possibly over sure. some dumb role in Tony and Tina's wedding. Well, I might be like overthinking it, but I, I, I believe that initially once she start, once she got in tow with him, she did realize he's kind of a loathsome human being as well in his own way. And that she, she, um, regretted. It was like buyer's remorse. She got into this thing and now she's like, okay, I can use him for something. Now they have a kid. They're stuck together. You know what I mean? And she knows what's the option divorce. And then what? Well, I don't see Fred as a particularly enjoyable social human being. No, God, no. So, you know, he marries her because he probably doesn't want to deal with going out and trying to find this on his own and socializing the entire process of dating. So, you know, I think they both mutually at times despised each other and regretted it. <laughs> yeah, I, I believe so. I mean, you guys, do you guys tell us your, your thoughts in the comment section, please? Oh my God, everybody left. You know, the, oh, the little nice. guy with no legs, he walked out. <laughs> <laughs> you and Fred talked all night long. I can't believe that. Believe it or not. And he hasn't said another word since. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. And last but not least, Dana, how did you meet Artie? Um, I was a bartender in Hoboken. And Artie would come in often for lunch. I worked a lunch shift. Um, And then at night, he'd start to come in. We became friends. He was like, (laughs) believe it or not, (laughs) the only, like, sane person in the bar (laughs) amongst all these other drunk animals. And I was just so happy to see him every time he came in. And um, we really became friends first. And uh, the night he finally made like his first romantic gesture he gave me his phone number and i was working on the rooftop bar in hoboken and that night he gives me his phone number i put it in my pocket i see him from the roof walking home with this blonde on his back (laughs) he was honestly giving this you know beautiful blonde girl a piggyback ride to his apartment with another couple and i said oh Okay. <laughs> and that was it. Okay. Now I found that actually really like funny. I, I, I did legitimately laugh at that, even though I've heard that before, that means it is a good story. Um, because you can laugh if you can laugh every time at a story, it's a good one. But I remember the, the first date story on the air, which would have been 2002 ish, 2001 ish. But like, like, I think it was like early in his tenure there. And it was funny as fuck. It was a great story. We may go through that one time just for fun, last shits and giggles. My immediate reaction as I looked at myself when I'm watching this on camera is I'm smiling. It's because you feel when she's telling the story, one, it's genuine, and two, there's warmth between them. Yes. Do you know what I'm saying? Well, you don't get that from either of the other four. No. Actually, I got that a little bit from Mr. X, a bit. and. Just a tiny bit, because I thought it was funny how he said, 
that they were both staring at each other and kind of playing this mating game. I thought that was a little cute. I'm not saying I was full smile, but I thought that was a little well, that was a cute I, anecdote for their little mating dance at the di- for that time. <laughs> but well, I, yeah, I think I think he's a tough he's a tough read. Uh, he is uh, tough maybe read. the toughest and because he wants to make everything a joke and people like that. And I'm, I'm, I'm similarly like that. Yeah. It takes uh, to, cr- to crack my, you know, armor, I guess, and start talking about things. It takes a little longer. Um, but, uh, but not like that. I mean, he, he definitely, uh, and on the other hand, can I expect anybody to be warm about Robin? I don't know. But the other reason is because both Mr. X and Dana are the only ones that, push themselves forward and tell their story with genuine confidence. And Mm -hmm. they seem to be nostalgic and sweet about it. I mean, Mr. X less so, but the others don't, they seem evasive and perturbed and a little pushbacky about it. I I don't. Well, the the other thing is marry it with, with was with Gary, like, I uh, don't see. They got married. If it's 2016, uh, but I guess Mary's with uh, Bear, with Bowie roughly the same amount of time as um, uh, Mr. X is with Robin, according to him. And so she's heard like she knows she is way deeper into the show than Artie is, and she knows the shit that's behind the scenes. And she hears it from Gary and Allison's the same in the in the same exact boat. Like she knows what this show is about and she doesn't want really have anything to do with it. Why they agreed to do this is some kind of, I, I'd love to know what it was that inspired them both to like, this is a good idea. Cause Allison, after the rainbow room in, sorry, after Fred's bachelor party, I don't think you ever heard her on the air again until this. No. Point. And it she, also, she was pissed. They used to go to those company picnics and stuff, but then, you know, they really faded off until all of a sudden this, which you're right. It is a real weird cataclysm. <laughs> Now, I, I think if it, the way it was, was Allison was pitched this like, uh, hey, you know, you'll get some drinks, you'll get together with the spouses and talk about the show. I think she welcomed the opportunity to maybe talk shit about the show in her own subtle way. I also think it was there was a lot of appearances for the openings of Sirius and the press and the coverage was mm-hmm. If you remember at the time, it was nonstop and there was a lot of events going on for this. So oh, yeah. I think Promo. that needing your wife's support was part of it because I remember seeing them at certain parties and certain functions. So there was more of a camaraderie as this was all unfolding and taking place. So yeah. I think maybe they felt more comfortable in this new space and mm-hmm. trying it on because it's not the same as the other show. Maybe, maybe that was it. Maybe it was a like a, a not a pardon the expression hail mary, but a uh, you know like a cleanse what, of the palate. Let's see what this let, let's see what right. this is going to be like. Right. What's the difference going to be going to this place exactly? So, so, but anyway, so he came back in and he was a little persistent, and I still adored the man as a friend. And then we got romantic, more romantic. So I forgave him. <laughs> How soon did you get romantic? Um, that next night, that no, <laughs> um, no, a little while after, okay. but so you forgave him for the blonde on the back. Yeah, was... because he, you know, he was a single guy and I was a single girl. So, you know, invasive Beth, this isn't your show, bitch. And I don't know who told her that she's a co-host. And yeah. by the way. Wow on you, Beth, for you said, don't ask me anything. We can move on. But you think that you can now suddenly take over the reins of the show and ask Dana, how long before you fucked him? Basically. I mean, well, yeah, well, that's exact. There's no other word that describes her. I'm sorry. In every. Yeah, no, uh, I'll say it first. Well, it's fine. I I use I throw that word around like past the salt. But um, the uh, the problem is, again, it, you can get away with what Beth was ju- what just did if you're likable. She's never been likable. And if you're open. Yeah. If you started saying we can move on. Don't ask me anything. It's just what right. Howard said. You sl- <laughs> you slipped into Hil- Hillary speak there for a second. I know. I just fucking <laughs> ugh. What yeah. is, what is it? It's gr- the grift speak is infecting you. No, like I think that in in any event, what happens with uh, with a, a situation like this, 
also there's a bit of jealousy, like suddenly, like subconsciously, there's a bit of jealousy that Dana and Artie are a legit item. Like at this point, yeah. they seem like a real couple. And you got to be thinking, wow, what's that like to really date someone and, and not have to worry about fucking your P's and Q's every goddamn minute of the day? What's it like to tell a story when you first met someone? Because I can remember my first time meeting Rick and I will tell it with that same genuine emotion and love and fondness every fucking time because that's how I felt. You could feel that coming off of Dana. And I think that Beth wishes, and you're right, is jealous that she cannot and doesn't no. have that. She does not <laughs> have that Genesis I, story. She can't say he picked me from the Dubai beard catalog and uh, you know, <laughs> like you know, that's just fucking a, some Australian guy. <laughs> right. I was at the tail end of a fucking chic gangbang and, and, you know, I, I got a, there was an ad in Penny Saver and I answered it. So here we go. But he made this romantic gesture. He gave me his phone number, I guess, finally, after having all these conversations and stuff. And anyway, I had to clear that up. Okay. Well, <laughs> now we know all the stories. Let's get to some of the questions. And the first obvious one I think would be how, and feel free to chime in as we go at any time. <laughs> How often do any of you listen to the show? On what basis? Allison? Oh, as much as I can. I mean, um, it's a little dominated by Nickelodeon and, and Dora the Explorer, <laughs> <laughs> considering the radio's in the one room with the television is, but I try and listen all the time. I Dana, love, how I about love you? the show. I'm sorry. Dana, how about you? Um, well, I teach, and I'm usually in school by 7.15, 7.30, so I really, you know, if, if anything try to listen for the first hour but since the move to Sirius I'm I'm not connected yet <laughs> so I haven't heard anything how are you not connected well because okay for fuck's sake like this you're right this is like this is yeah. mean girls asshole them well you heard in the beginning where she said I can't wait to ask but she said answer the question but she meant yeah. ask the questions uh, right 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 what gave her the impression that she was asking the questions. Who put her on that level in her head where she felt superior to them? She, she, well, first of all, she's the boss's girlfriend. I think that's part of it. But second of all, he directed her to ask questions. But did Jan Hine understand this? No, I don't believe so. Because it, it is coming across so fucking rude. Mm hmm. Now, it may just be drunk Beth being a fucking obnoxious jerk. Um, that That's just as likely, I suppose. But it would not surprise me if Howard it, way in advance said, look, you, look, you're going to be doing this. I want you to get some dirt from the people and ask whatever you want. It's fine. You're my girlfriend. They're not going to say shit. And that was how, it. How are you not connected? Uh, who cares? It would be a boring story anyway. Right. And the other thing is. Like, we really need to hear why the wires in your car aren't hooked up. Who gives a fuck? Because your fucking beard assignment won't give anybody free rep memberships that belong to the fucking, you know, part of the show. Like, we have to pay for it. Yeah, we don't have a staff to install it. I'm a teacher. Did you hear me? I work full time and I yeah. bartend. So I have a second job, you fucking yeah. hoofing cunt. Now, who knows if she was still bartending at the time, but it, they, that's absolutely like uh, one of those things where she probably on the side to make some more money. Yeah, absolutely needed to. My serious radio is sitting at the bottom of Artie's closet right next, <laughs> right next to the TiVo that I got him not too long ago. So the two of them are sitting there. And <laughs> so glad you it. asked that question. Beth, Beth. I don't listen to the show. Not at all. Oh, if occasionally if I'm getting reports that something is going on, that's talking about me or something else. <laughs> so if it's concerning me, I listen <laughs> the ego much. <laughs> The narcissism is off the charts. Oh my fucking god! Every I, you know, I listen. I've seen this a number of times. I still get kind of douche chills listening to her and watching her because she was. Oh, first of all, she was given stink eye to Dana the whole time, and I imagine like, and this is not, uh, not unlike a lot of women I've met in my life. The drink brings out the absolute worst in the the sort of mean girls, the bitchiness aspect. So women like this. They're 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 completely unbearable, and I I've often like I go is that the wine making them more into what they are, or 
Is it, you know, that whole don't mix with whiskey, that kind of thing. This is really a good person, but don't give them this kind of thing. I think it's more likely the former. I don't know, but it's just bad all around. I also find it so hilarious that she just said, why don't you have it hooked up? I don't listen. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, so you're, you took the time to take over the show to ask her why she doesn't have it hooked up as if it's offensive Mm -hmm. and make her give this explanation. But then you don't listen unless it's about you. What a fucking see you next Tuesday. Oh, by the way, keep in mind, this is something that only a, a real like hardcore fan would point out. They, she gave Howard shit about his women wearing his, wearing his boots on the carpet in their house, right? In the Ablo segment. Right. Look who's got their shoes on the fucking <laughs> chair. <laughs> Which I, I fucking that. loathe. I just fucking loathe when people do that. I mean, if it's your own home and uh, you're wearing, you know, oh, slippers or something, I get it. Okay. But someone else is, someone that, else is going to sit there. That sitting is such a position of entitlement that way that she's sitting with that fucking shoe on that chair tucked under her leg is such a clear sense of entitlement and spoiled brat yeah well maybe she can't cross her legs because there's a cock in between anyway i don't know look look, based on what i'm seeing in front of me you're you might not be far off yeah I'll I'm, I'm going to ask Mary and Mr. X, but first I got to go back to it because both you and Dana alluded to it. Do you guys get like 84 messages on your cell phone if something happens yes, relating 85. to you? 85. Mm-hmm. So instantly you know what's going What's going? I usually down. call Howard's assistant, Laura, to see what's going on. And then I tune in to hear the conversation. Then I either call Gary back or I don't when he leaves a message on my Does anybody else who has this sort of scenario happen call an assistant to find out. (laughs) Could you imagine if Laura's doing something in the middle of her day for Howard and Lord knows what is on that to-do list and she gets a text or a call from Beth saying, what's going on on the show? I heard it's about me. Let me wait, Beth. Hold on, honey. I'll find out for you. Fuck you. So not only are you a self-absorbed piece of shit, but you're also admitting you don't give a fuck about your husband's radio show. Just turn it on. Just turn it on. Instead, you'd rather inconvenience somebody who's making way less money than whatever he's giving you. Yeah. You're going to inconvenience their day to find out and play telephone for an hour. You fucking (laughs) bitch. (laughs) <laughs> you just get. I can see the steam oh. coming off the. Off oh, your, the, off the your sense forehead. of the title of this, and she's sitting here like a spoiled little brat, like Meadow Soprano, you know. So, Except for Meadow was a teenager, I can accept that. Uh, well, so is Beth in her mind. Voicemail. So it's almost like an instant alert. For instant you. alert. Yeah. Allison, how about you? Yeah, same thing. <clears throat> I actually, you know, there was a while when I was not listening for a while because I just couldn't, you know. My spy, I, I just couldn't deal with listening, you know, people calling in. And I just said, you know what? I'm not going to listen for a while, but I love the show. <laughs> that was that sounded authentic. <laughs> I like how she just said my spies and then cut off. She didn't cut it. You're right. I noticed that too. My spies. So she has friends listening to the show and that would inform for her. Yes. <laughs> the fucking As they all do. Norris CIA. <laughs> Art, Art, I always loved Artie's impression. He goes, he goes, I, I, you know, I love that secondhand information that gets to Dana from the from the girls that work in the salon. Did you hear what that monster, <laughs> what that, what that big disgusting monster said about you? <laughs> <laughs> well, Allison Norris, I could just see the drunk Jersey wine moms. Oh, my God, Allison, you should have heard what Freddie said today. <laughs> well, she actually, I, I think I'm not mis- if I'm not mistaken, isn't she from Long Island as well? I don't know. I can't remember. I have to go back on that one. This like, We're talking way, way back. Even James and Raven might know, but um, that's, that's major trivia. But anyway, uh, but she goes, I, but I love the show. She, that was the save. She knew she had to add that. She completely fucked up and had to put that ad on that little <laughs> that little yep. nice ending i thought she was from tony and tina's wedding that amazing production <laughs> yeah really awesome. dana i i have to say i um especially this week 
I get a lot of phone calls. I really do. And I respect that. And I think the feedback that I get from my friends has been pretty consistent with with what Artie says happened. But um, I have to say that the month off or so ever since Sirius, uh, you know, Howard's moved to Sirius, it's been a nice little break, you know, just, you know, from listening every day and only because I really do support Artie. I think he's, you know, insanely talented and I enjoy hearing him do what he's best at. But, you know, it was a nice little break, I have to say. I mean, I want to hook the series up and everything, but, you know, sometimes you you need that break. See how she by the way, just gave that gesture. I, I'll hook the series up and she nods and looks over to Beth and puts her hand down and she nods her head in a knowing fashion saying, I'm acknowledging your point that my radio isn't hooked up. Thank you for embarrassing me in mm-hmm. front of the group of people and the listeners to make it seem that I'm not supportive. So yeah. now because she asked that question, she is couching this response in such a casually perfect way of not only sounding genuine and supportive, but she's also being honest about how much like how social media is an addiction and really fucks up relationships because you know where everybody is and who's interacting with them all times. This is like the foray into that. If you're somebody like Dana, where you can turn on the radio and you're hearing things that maybe you necessarily aren't going to make that isn't necessarily going to make your mental health better or your Mm -hmm. relationship better because it is a lot of time, just comedy or a joke, or maybe it is the truth, but you want to have a conversation person to person, not on a radio show and hear it secondhand or firsthand from that sort of medium, just like the way people don't really want to see or read or hear things that are typed out on social media. I think it's similar. So you turned it off for a month, probably for your own mental health, But Beth had to make that cunty comment about why isn't it turned on or why don't you have it turned on? So this is a perfect ladylike response. Amazing. You know, I I think you guys. Absolutely. Can attest to that. Mary, do you listen? I listen. You know, I have two boys and um, you can't listen now at all. It's serious. You never know what you're going to hear. So um, I listen less than I used to. Um, How often did you listen when it was on terrestrial radio? You know, I listen to it sort of coming and going, you know, when I'm going here and there in the car at home, not at all. So I I don't know, at the most an hour a day. Well, you can understand it for a number of reasons. Number one, Allison and, and Mary were both mothers and that you have young kids, especially. So, and, and, yeah, and I know that Mary's a do nothing mo- mother, like she's the tennis lesson mom. Um, but. But, you know, and and I understand it's not always feasible, but because the show was on early in the morning now with the series, okay, you can catch the replay, but it may not be her cup of tea to tune in suddenly one day and hear her husband getting fucking berated and treated like a five year old by her his asshole underpaying boss. That's what she's not wanting to say. She's wanting to say, but she can't say, obviously. That and who wants to hear their husband, you know, setting up the Sibian for the next ride. You know, it's all encompassing. Yeah. Plus, you're right. She got into the mom mode, but not only the mom mode, she got into the nanny, waspy, Connecticut housewife mom mode where that requires a lot of I drop my kids off to school, go get my nails done, go to tennis lessons, go to brunch, go home. (laughs) Yeah. But often not at all. Like last week, I didn't hear it at all. So anything leading up to today, I haven't, you know, I'm not really that aware of. I heard a little bit of the Dana already business. Do you have people <laughs> reporting to you? People report into me, and usually it's wrong. Again! Because I think my sources are not very good or something, <laughs> but it's like telephone. So, you know, sometimes I'll call Gary, and he'll be like, what? And it was so off base. So I try not to do that. <laughs> she can't help herself. She can. And it's so strange to me that they've all been here, besides Dana, way longer than Beth. Why didn't anybody have the gumption to say, do you have spies? If it were me and I were Mary and I've been there way longer than you, honey, and knew Allison, the wife, and know the whole scenario, Gary Mm -hmm. has spilled everything. Yeah. I wouldn't take this shit for a second. I would say, do you? Immediately. (laughs) He spilled he spilled truckloads of twinnings Earl Grey uh, explaining Howard's ins and outs and comings and goings, uh, especially comings. And uh, like she 
if, if this is the thing I'm also uh, cognizant of, Mary has the protection of not being buoy. She could say what she likes. Howard's not going to say dick to Mary Delabate. He's not confrontational in that way. He would make Gary's life a living hell as a result of something like that coming out here. But she's protected. But do you think, okay, my question to you, do you think Gary, because clearly the side eye initially when Beth answered the first question the way she did, and mm-hmm. we saw that obvious physical response from Mary, how she yeah, it, was a, it was completely involuntary. <laughs> she did her best to make it seem natural, but Mary, bah, yeah, we, see, we saw that response. Yeah. Do you think that Mary was given an edict by Gary just refrain from doing anything overly bitchy or responsive or inquisitive to Beth because it's going to make my life hell. Ah, that's a good question. Uh, I like see that, that the question really what, what you're really asking is, do I think Gary is smart enough to be proactive and tell her this? And the answer is no. I don't think Bowie would consider. I think he also maybe innately knows that Mary, if he's, she's not going to defend Gary at a spa. <laughs> she's not going to be the one to confront uh, Beth about anything. Okay. So then do you think that Mary is savvy enough to just innately understand that this trollop is going to be disrespectful, make some of us uncomfortable, but ultimately it's not worth pushing back on? Uh, yeah, exactly that. Because the other thing is, uh, Mary goes back, let's see, 92, 90, early 90s, let's say, when they were mm-hmm. dating before they got married. So she would have maybe known Allison or heard Allison, like spent right. some time when they had staff stuff, uh, if they had any staff get togethers. And uh, who knows what Allison would have told her about Howard. Exactly. You know what I mean? And then like, and maybe even sympathize and say, listen, I don't like the way he treats Gary, that kind of thing and all that stuff, you know, and then maybe, and, and for all I know, maybe I'm giving Allison too much credit. Maybe she was an evil bitch and didn't give a selfish person and didn't give a fuck about Bowie or however anybody else was treated because she was already be- having to take care of herself being mistreated by this cocksucker. Um, but uh, I'm talking about Allison, Mary Howard's wife, I know. obviously. And uh, just because really, the people who got two Allison's, I've got to make sure I get that out. But um but I think she, yeah, mostly she's just savvy enough. Keep it on the down low. Just try to be as, you know, you know, stay under the speed limit, that kind of shit. I think maybe too, since this is a new venture and this is a new segment, maybe she's playing it extra coy and cautious. Mm-hmm. Because he also, Bowie's just got that raise, the serious raise. Right. And she doesn't want to jeopardize that. That's a great point. Because they're not in the Connecticut house until the following year, I believe. And they're probably making like mm-hmm. inroads into looking to a place and to become Mrs. Uh, Mary Bowie, ba- Bowie Gatsby. And um, and that she doesn't want to get that fucked with. She certainly doesn't. Yep. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Mr. X, how about you? How often do you listen to the show? I listen sporadically. Uh it's the five hours during the day. It's the only time I can shut Robin up. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Let's go to the phones. We've got a couple of great calls already. Let's go to Zergog in San Jose. You're on the better half. Hey, great. How's everyone doing? How's the panel doing? Hello. Good. Welcome to oh, the great. view. <laughs> Don't be shy. You can all speak up at once. Hello. Dana, your thong is sticking out. Oh, I'm sorry. Zergog. Can you get it's that? Hard. Oh, oh what? she is so... Yeah. That, the, by the way, her teeth are disgusting when she made Should that I, face. Let yeah, me go back, go back there just a bit. Okay, let's see. Horse face, disgusting fuck. Okay, you keep talking. I'm just going to just gonna scroll All through. Right. So as she made that little comment there, yeah, you could see that um Watch that, this that side grin. profile, She's, guys. It's, it's pre-nose job, guys, because this is the same year as that Seinfeld picture where he's looking at the wig, the two of them lo- leaving some restaurant, okay. and her nose is massive. Yeah, one sec, it's coming up. And uh, either way, it, it's that self-satisfied joker thing. Hold on. Keep okay, going. there we go. go I think a that's further. it. Go <laughs> further. Get there. Yeah. That. <laughs> Uh-huh, your song is silly. <laughs> Have you seen the music videos in 2000s early? Everybody's song was showing. They literally had red carpets of thongs outside of dresses. 
By the way, Everybody. her phone's not showing to the camera, you fucking no. adult. You're just being a bitch and looking at her and picking her apart because she's in a happy relationship or a real relationship with all its problems, whatever it is. At least it's real. Do you, you think are she's not in something real? Do you think it's also, and I maybe I'm going too far out on speculation boulevard here, but do you think it's also she innately is jealous of Dana naturally looking really cute? Yes. It's that me it's that mean girls thing, but literally it's it's one of it's it like literally she's back in high school now. Beth is very uncomfortable around pretty girls. She mm-hmm. always mentions how beautiful they are. She is very uncomfortable with her own beauty, even though I don't think she's beautiful. Apparently some people thought she was beautiful enough to be some, you know, catalog model, whatever. Yeah. Ames. Regardless. She has clearly had these insecurities about her looks for a long time. And this puts it on, this puts it on speed. So when you have somebody who's just a bartender teacher sitting there looking effortlessly more adorable than you, yeah, yeah. you're going to look behind her, not to the camera, to point out that her thong is showing. (laughs) Like to try to debase her. Of course. Like, she, like okay, now someone's going to say, you guys are looking too far into it. Fuck you. She's trying to be funny. She's trying to be, well, she's not being funny, first of all. It just, and the way it comes off, you know, there are people that can tell jokes. Like Don Rickles, a Don Rickles joke told by Howard is not a funny joke anymore. She's this, particularly paying attention yeah. to Dana. Specifically, is, yeah. Why? She is honing in on everything Dana's saying and making sure to possibly put her in the worst light possible possible like you don't have your radio hooked up your thong showing what you didn't wait what did you when did you sleep with him or what when was it when you got romantic she's purpose to try to make her seem easy she's not nice no she's not and this is what we've been trying to tell people for years check out that video from the uh the 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 video with the puppy with her pulling that puppy away from the worker that's beth like that That's was her. And, uh, that was that was an unguarded, unscripted moment captured on film. Also, the it's no longer there, unfortunately. If anybody has it, please let us know. The video of her with Al Roker saying Howard's a pessy, and that mm-hmm. big grin, that massive grin of hers, like, and he goes like Cat. now, right? Exactly. Like her trying to be funny, and it's it's obnoxious. It's not endearing, and it's the direct opposite. You're starting to hate her if you didn't know anything about her. Yes. Yep. That's it's hot. Me. Can you get that for me? <laughs> Zergog, what's your question? Okay. Well, first of all, I want to say, since I know that their significant others are listening, I want to say hello to Howard and everybody else. But my question is for Mr. X. And Mr. X, I there's probably no real nice way of saying this, but I do mean this out of respect. Um, why do you go by Mr. X? I mean, you really should be proud that you're with uh, Robin. I mean, she's a very wonderful woman, sweet, lovely, beautiful, big tatas, all that good stuff. <laughs> it, it's not that you're, you know, I mean, you're not so egotistical that you have to go by Mr. X. What's the story, bro? We want to know who you are. Well, I, used to, I used to have a sensitive job for the government. So it, when I was working with the government, I didn't want to... Uh reveal my identity. And now it's just become kind of a joke and we enjoy it, so I appreciate it going. And you've just been rolling with it ever since. Exactly. Okay, very nice. Let's go to Nathan in Cincinnati. Nathan, you are on Nathan, you're on the better half. Hello. Nathan, you're on the better half. Oh sweet. Oh hey, what's going on? Uh I got a question for uh Mary Delabante. Oh. <laughs> go ahead. Hey. Bye. How's it going? I'm good. Uh, How are you? No, I uh, I wanted to know. Like uh, Gary always strikes me as like kind of a kinky guy. You guys ever uh, he ever call or you ever call him uh, Baba Booey in bed? <laughs> well, that's not my idea of kinky, but um, you know what? I'll do it for you. <laughs> what if what if he uh, what if he's having an off night and you know you know. You- now, this is what I find a little disturbing. Beth, the whole time this question has been going on, I've been keeping an eye on her, not Mary. She's been eyeing Mary up and down the entire time. And now she's looking at her like someone looks at a fucking zoo animal. And it's to me, it's disturbing. It, it's, it's, a way, it's, it's just really, really off-putting. She is finding ways to observe them so she can 
come up with ways to cut them down in yeah, debase them at some point. Mm-hmm. That uh, that has to be what it is, isn't it? Like she's doing a low rent Howard. She is. She's reading them. Shit's rolling downhill. Oh, we lost him. Oh, but no. Oh, <laughs> you. Did you do that on purpose? No, I didn't. Mr. Kinky. Actually, I didn't. But uh, yeah, I don't know whose idea of kinky that might be, Mary. No. But he brings up an interesting point. Not the kinky part, but the Baba Booey part. Does that bother you? Like how Gary's always referred to as it with Sal songs and everything else. How do you feel about that? Well, the Baba Booey thing, I think, is cute. You know, they oh. call me Mrs. Booey sometimes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um. No, I mean, I don't like, you know, we went away with Sal over the summer. We went, Heineken took us to Amsterdam and to Paris, and I never met him before. And I thought, when when Sal got the job full-time, I said, Gary, you have to quit. How can you work with Sal? I mean, he's just impossible. He's rude. He's so mean. But um, I learned to like him a lot. He's a really hilarious guy. So, you know, Gary has a hard shell, and I try to have a hard <laughs> shell. and not. Like- <laughs> Anybody that can give Gary shit, I'm sure she's more than happy to fucking bond with, and that would be Sal. Yeah, she loves, <laughs> she loves it. I mean, if she didn't say anything in that uh, spa. <laughs> right. No, she loves being the top in that relationship. For sure. Yeah. Let it bother me. Hmm. So, you know, I turn it off if I don't like it. Now, in the past, Howard's gotten on Gary pretty strong. I think a lot less recently, but beforehand, he used to beat him up pretty good. How would you feel about that? I feel bad. I can tell when Gary's taking it hard. And when, you know, he's letting it just sort of brush you off. So, um, you know, I think it's gotten better. He's been a little bit, you know, kinder to Gary. So thank God for that. Howard's so happy at Sirius that I think his whole demeanor at home has just been, he's just been floating around in in bliss land. He's so happy. I think everybody feels that. I really do. So this is, I am going to come to the defense of my bag Howard. <laughs> yeah. And so he's floating around in Blissland. Everything's wonderful. He's not did a she, fucking asshole. She did sound like she was coming off like a little fairy pixie going through like, yes, it's wonderful. That, that was a little wistful, right? You know, Beth's fairy tales, Grimm's fairy tales. Um, I think that um, I'm trying to think of 2006. Just did, 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 was there any drop off in, in shitting on Bowie? I think it was worse than ever because number one, guests were not as uh, readily available for Sirius, and he would get pissed off. Remember the Rachel Hunter thing? Yep. That was mm-hmm. early, that was the first month of Sirius. Then we covered the Rolling Stone. Um, God, what's his name? Rob, she- not Rob. Yeah, Rob Sheffield article, and yes. he was butthurt about that. Then the Mary Jones thing that I covered with Bob. That's going to be uh, wrapping up soon as well. Um, and and the, was, uh, what's, was, it, what's his face? Pins- the um, what what's the other one? journalist? The New York Post or the uh, remember uh, the English one? I don't. What did I say? Oh, and, that was that. Which oh, which one was the um, the one about uh, him stealing a line from Johnny Carson? Yes. I believe that was 2004, if I'm not mistaken. No, it's no, that was that was 2006. You're right. That was him going, I'm going to go back to that. <laughs> he told that story on the air about <laughs> wanting to go back and be like Rambo. Beth had to hold him back. <laughs> so he was he was more sensitive than ever, if anything, going to satellite. He was not, you know, that's something that should have given him some kind of security, this big bump of money and shit. It, if anything, it made him worse. He's floating around. He's just been so... I like how she had to cut into her anecdote. Howard. She's, she, Howard's been in Blissland. We're talking about Gary. Yeah. <laughs> so. All right, let's take another call. So, Brian in New York, you're on so. The Better Half. Hey, how you guys doing? My question is for Allison. How you doing, Allison? <laughs> Hi, how are you? Good. I want to know... When you and your husband, the kids are in bed, you're going at it, you're having a great time, it's late <laughs> at night, are you screaming out Eric or are you screaming out Fred? What's your name? My name is Brian. I'm screaming out Brian. Oh, come on. <laughs> Eric or Fred, tell me. Oh, come on. You call him Fred, Don't right? You, I call him Fred, yeah. But, you know, it's kind of romantic. I feel like I have two husbands in a way. So it kind of depends. Um, I call him Fred. You see, the one thing that you'll pick up when this airs on On Demand later is the look of dread and fear when the call is like, <laughs> everyone's excited for the call to come in, but then the name comes up, and there are four sighs of relief, and there's one like, oh, my God. I'm surprised no one's asked Dana about her situation. Um. Actually. Oh. 
what a fucking what a fucking whore she pushed her too and i would have slapped her god that would have been there would have been a foot to the face at some point because i think the the other problem is guys like these are all quote unquote spouses girlfriends as they call them wags in england wives and girlfriends um but what it is is they at this point are sort of on the outs like dana and artie were always insy outsy so this is one of the down times when they're not really together for some reason because i think he's back into heroin and it's not long before he does the admission on the air but man look at that fucking bitch smile and she wanted to bring this out so badly that she couldn't even wait for a caller to ask so imagine her she is just evil (laughs) imagine her at the wedding when she's drunk fuck and imagine her at the birthday bash 2013 i I love chevy chase even more yeah and people are asking where's that audio (laughs) it's like god it is the holy grail it is the holy grail i if this were a real housewives show and this wasn't you know, this probably is the original Real Housewives, but mm-hmm. if if this was a Housewives reunion of some sort, that person would have got up from that chair and pummeled Beth. Yes, absolutely. Without any fear of retribution from, you know, King Baby. No, they would have gotten more money in their next contract. <laughs> Big time. <laughs> As Beth segues, it's gonna kill me. The question for all you guys: I'm is, so happy. <laughs> um, when people learn who you are, do they treat you a different way? Like, are you treated a certain way because you're on this turn show? And I mean that in a positive or a negative way. Beth, you're sort of out there in the public; people see you, you know, already. <sighs> so, well, but you should answer the question too. How do people, how do people deal with you guys in again a positive or a negative way? This, her face waiting for this question anticipating this because you fucking know she was waiting for something like this is so smug and it's so (laughs) yes i'm special and important i wasn't but now i am but i did have a modeling career i'm super educated but thank you for asking jet i am so important it's so different i'm did we not i fucking hate her did we not cover the fhm thing where she says I used to be tough to get tables, but now I say I'm Beth's girl. I'm Howard's girlfriend, and with tables just open up. Yes, <laughs> I can't go on a walk anymore. Everything's different. The Knicks games, <laughs> we get free Knicks games. Oh, oh, that was my favorite one. Howard doesn't pay for anything. <laughs> <laughs> now we get free everything. <laughs> you fucking freeloading horse. <laughs> Now listen, one of my favorite books, uh, Bob Geldof's, is that if the uh, there's a the one of the band members of the Boomtown Rats said was asked a question by a, a journalist, and they said, "What's the best thing about being famous?" And the guy literally just went and said, "You can get into other people's gigs for free," and it was like, "There's, it's not." It wasn't, he, he did it spontaneously just saying, look, it was all these things you used to have to be such a hassle to get in to see a, a band perform. Now all of a sudden you can be backstage in a guest thing because there's certain, the, he was just being honest about it. The, but there's a difference between being legitimately honest, spontaneous sincerity, in other words, and someone being a little smug and pompous about it the way she is. Being an entitled, humble, bragging bitch. Yeah, yes. I'd say so. <laughs> right. You're not winning any fans over. It's only different when I go shopping. It's almost annoying. People cater to me and it's, um, oh. there was an instance where there was a really popular bridal company who was treating the bridesmaids horribly, but treating me like a queen after they found out who I was. And so we called them on it and I was really, it was a whole thing. But yeah, I'm definitely treated differently. <laughs> it's almost annoying. <laughs> <laughs> she I'm had to be the Mary. noble knight. <laughs> oh, yeah. She's such a fucking hero. Hero to the people, Beth. Look at Mary. Mary glanced over at Dana, and I guarantee if the camera zoomed out and we saw yeah, Dana, Dana shot. was it was a wide shot of Mary and Dana Look glancing it. back and forth and Allison and Mary glancing back and forth. This bitch has no idea how horrible she's coming up. Um, I felt really bad, especially when I'm shopping. Yeah. Oh, God. You're treated like a queen. <laughs> Did I make a mistake by suggesting we do this episode? Because you're going to have to start like hitting the heavy bag soon after this just to get the aggression out. I know. Do I have steam pouring out of my earphones? And- 
It's not yeah. just Beth. It's people like this. Well, yeah. For me, in general, yeah. it's not just Beth. I cannot stand people like this. <laughs> well, ill-mannered people. Um, it's it's people more that than pe- that. But no, but yeah, people who are who feel they're entitled to the world. It's their oyster. Um, and people like you can be rich and you can be well off and you can still be a nice person. But it's people who gaslight that this privilege that they clearly have is they're indicating that they're special, but they're still good people because they wish that the the shopping people were paying attention to the bride and not them. I'm nice. It's such gaslighting narcissism. I can't stand it. Yeah, well, it's 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 like a, a horrible way of explaining how you like it, you sell, a way of self aggrandizing your own like uh, like non like fake goodness at the expense of other people saying, oh, they were mistreated, but I wasn't because I was fantastic. The sto- the way the story works out perfectly is when you say we were all being mistreated. And then I mentioned I was I was, you know, Howard Stern's beard. And then they said, oh, well, right this way. That at least sounds more um I guess more honest. Or how about I realized they were being mistreated and I was being treated like a queen. So I stepped in and I said, hey, I'm not special. You better focus on a bride. I'm just shopping. Right. But the way it sounds like the way it sounds like I became like, you know, Miss I became Miss Stern and to be, and all of a sudden, you know, they were like, oh, step and fetch. You're not Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. No, you're Shut not. Shut up. And no. I also, she just, the virtue signaling of. I, I stuck up for the sig- little people. <laughs> I stick up for the little people, but I actually didn't do anything. I just noticed. I observed yeah. it. And now I'm giving this anecdote to make everybody know how important I am and cool and special I am. But yeah. she also doesn't give any indication of their Genesis story. She can't retell. She won't ask questions. She doesn't like, and we're all supposed to what when we hear this? Yes, Like her? Does. Yeah. No, not happening. Ace and they think that I, I need hors d'oeuvres or champagne and I don't. <laughs> <laughs> <But yeah. laughs> okay. Allison, how about you? Charming. You know, it's weird. Some, uh, you know, I don't really tell people and then when they find out they're usually it's usually very positive it's like oh my god you're fred's wife i love fred you know it's really a very positive response so it's kind of you know it's kind of nice and then when they start asking a lot of questions i'm like all right i gotta go goodbye (laughs) it's also more irritating the fact that beth is recently new to this picture in comparison to all of them except for dana and dana is way more humble and genuine and charismatic and likable But all of these people sitting in these chairs have been around forever. So for her to come off this way, when I know Howard's the boss, he's the star, but they've all been in this position and famous for way longer, by the way, in much more famous times. Well, in the, in the mythology of how they got together, she's longer, she's there longer than, than, than Dana is with Artie, but but up to a point there, it was like, oh, no, she only shows up in 2001 after I've been caught trying to fucking hook up with uh, <laughs> Lila Arcieri. But now it's like, oh, well, we've been dating since 2000. So either way, she's and there's a don't like, forget that porn star, uh, e- that porn star anecdote. What was her name? That one? Oh, oh said what, that the, uh, the st- what? The stripper with the Mercedes? Nope. The one where the remember we were trying to get an interview with her, the porn star. Oh, who, oh, oh, uh, no. Uh, G Chup went and got uh, uh, got her name. Oh, God. What was her name? Fuck. Tabitha Stevens. Yes. Yeah. Who said like he dabbles mm-hmm. in, uh, you know, ACDC. Well, mm-hmm. here's the thing. Beth to me is coming off like there never was an Allison. I, I'm the first wife. That's the, that's what's, that's the, what's disconcerting about this. But we grew up with like listening to Allison, uh, you know, Howard's first wife as being the kind of counterpoint to his bullshit. And when you lose that, like, I don't think he quite understood exactly what he was losing, not just in the divorce, but in the show when he Mm -hmm. didn't have that foil and that little bit of conflict. So when you all of a sudden, you know, what's that expression Jay likes to use, uh, iron sharpens iron. Now that doesn't happen anymore. Now it's just a blunt fucking show, blunt knife, the show. It's a blunt spoon with knife. It and really it, is a brick off of a top of a building like Marvin Home Alone, right yeah. to the forehead. You there is yeah. no there is Push nothing. Back. 
pushback. No. There's nothing. It's a fucking brick to the head. They're also, now that you mentioned Allison, it is weird to me because I have a co-parenting relationship and I love me a stepmom. I can't imagine somebody speaking like this and you're married to my ex-husband. You don't even talk about the kids. You talk about the most vapid shit. Yes. You what? You have somebody with three kids. This is <laughs> what you're Al- talking Allison's about. Like, you think like Allison's like Susan Sarandon and stepmom? <laughs> Oh, man, I don't know what I would be like. I, I just what a dunce. Well, yeah, it's it's it, you, you can't imagine like you say, what was the what was the line she said? We've already named her Bimba. Yeah. And I think what? remember Richie Wilson said there's no love lost. <laughs> no, none whatsoever. <laughs> That's expression. I care about the right to shove an eel up a girl's vagina. Yeah, in China, in China, they can't videotape a woman getting shot up. <laughs> <laughs> Coyote fucking. <laughs> That's what we have. Why did we fight the revolutionary war? I think it's obvious so a woman can fuck a moose. <laughs> In the pages of Oswa. <laughs> England under King George never had moose fucking. But we grew. <laughs>